Douglas Lyle, PhD, is the founder of Esteem Dynamics, a new method of approaching human psychology and well-being. This approach was born out of Dr. Lyle's 25 years of clinical experience wedded to the deep insights into human nature. Dr. Lyle received his undergraduate degree from the University of California in San Diego. He completed his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Virginia, where he was awarded the President's Fellowship and was a DuPont Scholar. He was then appointed lecturer in psychology at Stanford University and worked on the research staff at the Department of Veteran Affairs at the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder in Palo Alto, California. In addition to his work with Esteem Dynamics, he is currently the Director of Research for the True North Health Center, and he also serves as the psychologist for the McDougal Wellness Program. He is also the author of one of my favorite books, The Pleasure Trap. I had an amazing time talking with him, and I can't wait to share it with you. Here goes. Okay, I want to start. I, I, I read this book, The Pleasure Trap, uh, years ago, and I loved it. I mean, I was just hooked because so much of this stuff I hadn't heard before, and it all makes so much sense. And so, your um, approach is really unique because you're coming from the perspective of human psychology. Right. And so many books that I've read and that are out there about the whole food plant based diet, which is what I'm a proponent of, um, go go over like why. You know, why eating a whole food plant-based diet is so important for protecting us from, you know, our biggest killers and heart disease and certain cancers and all of this. And all that stuff is, of course, really important. But your book was all about why people don't eat healthy even when they know it's the best thing for them. So they right. they have maybe read, read Dr. Furman and read, watched the Dr. Greger videos and read Dean Ornish and McDougal. And they know it. They know that it's the thing to do. They know that it's best for them, but something happens. And just from my experience doing what I do, it's like they'll go for maybe a wedding or a weekend, you know, a long weekend or a birthday party. And maybe they'll be, you know, eating a lot of whole, whole food plant-based stuff. And then this one weekend they'll eat you know, some pizza and have some beers and some cake. And then it kind of starts this downward spiral and it just kind of sets them on this path of, okay, well that salad that was really good a few days ago, all of a sudden isn't so good. And so they turn to those foods that are more attractive. Um, and so you describe, so, I mean, there's a whole reason behind this. It's not just that they don't have willpower or they suck or they can't get it together. And so many people think that that's the case. You know, they right. beat themselves up thinking, I just don't have willpower. I don't know why I can't get back on track. I was doing really well. And then, you know, I, I had a really exciting weekend and now I can't get back on track. But there's actually a very legitimate reason why this happens, which is why this book for anybody who hasn't read it is a must read and why I love your work so much because you really come at it from, um, you know, a from the psychology behind all this, which is a huge piece of this puzzle. So can you just start by kind of explaining, explaining the pleasure trap and why this happens to really smart people? <laughs> right. Uh, there's, there's many ways to explain this, but for, for some reason, this is the one that comes to mind today. Okay. Uh, if you think about your, your porch light and you think about moths, Mm -hmm. The uh, sometimes you'll I'll come outside. My porch light's been on all night. And there'll be like 15 dead moths on the ground. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that's true is that moths are designed to fly to light. In fact, they're designed to fly to the brightest objects in the sky. Those happen to be the moon. And so they're designed to use the moon and other celestial objects as anchor points, as essentially a compass a mechanism mm -hmm. so that they can find their way home and find their way to important food supplies etc so depending upon the type of animal they've got different levels of sophistication mm -hmm. but the point is is that they're that the what they have is they have a inexorable drive to fly to the light and then they fly to the light so far and then they get up i don't know 50 feet or however high they go and then then a mechanism shuts off and then they go fly to other things and so they use this, uh, they use this, this uh, indicator in nature to tell them what to do. 
And so, unfortunately for them, um, a street lamp or my porch light is is brighter than the, than the moon. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, they fly to it, and then they hit the glass, and they're disoriented, and they, they tumble back back down out of the sky a little bit, and then they see it again, and they hit it again, and then they hit it again, and they hit it again, and all night long they're flying in delight, and it's exhausting because they never get to where they're supposed to go, which is going to go mate or eat food and then rest or whatever it is that they do. Mm -hmm. So instead, they are they are dragged into that light over and over again in the dot. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, this is the capturing of an instinct mm -hmm. by an artificial uh, energy source mm -hmm. in the world today that didn't exist uh, in their ancestral history. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what modern foods are. Modern foods are an unnatural energy source that is now widely available. Mm -hmm. And human beings are flying to the light. And mm -hmm. they do it over again, even though they know better. You know, even though they find out that it's not good for them, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Survival instinct number one is what I call it. Survival instinct number one is eat the richest food in the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that was the, the, the best advice that our ancestors could pass down genetically mm -hmm. over the course of human natural history. And so... It runs deep and strong inside of everybody's motivational system. Mm -hmm. And to, uh, when we find out that now, here in the last hundred years, they've switched the food up. Mm -hmm. And now the food is too rich. Mm -hmm. um, but, but now, it, to, to stop that instinct is is exceedingly difficult to do. So that's why people are having a problem. And that's why this is, you know, once we have the insight about what we should be eating, that is truly step one in a hundred step journey. And uh, that, that's why it's rarely enough to read a, a smart book about this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, what these fine doctors has, you know, have been on the cutting edge of this, mm -hmm. you know, like Google, Assistant, Ornish, et cetera. So these are all, this is all great information, but it's not going to take you that yeah. far as a normal human. And that's the pleasure trap is basically saying, listen, this is going to be a hard journey. Uh, expect it to be difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and then in it, we talk about the things that you need to do to make it more likely to be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and that's really, and, and again, for anybody who hasn't read it, you really go over all this in detail. And I think to, to, to really understand that, to kind of piece this together, can you just talk quickly about the motivational triad and how <clears throat> we're built, like we, like you said, these instincts so that we can reproduce, basically, and that's like our job in life. So can you right. go over these motivational triads that everybody has? <clears throat> sure. Um, every kind of creature has a basic motivational system in other words, why they do what they do. And they're getting, they're getting cues from their insides, uh, and they're designed to look for certain targets in the environment. They're attracted to certain things and they are repulsed by others. Mm -hmm. And so they're attracted to, like if they're a predator, they're attracted to food, uh, they're attracted to animals that they eat. And also, but a lot of predators are also prey animals. So they're also repulsed by the animals that might eat them. Right. And so they're, they essentially have pushes and pulls inside mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the basic, it uh, doesn't matter what kind of creature you are, you have the same basic architecture. And the architecture is that you pursue things that we that cause pleasure, mm -hmm. and those things are food and sex. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then those, uh, then there's also the avoidance of pain. Mm -hmm. So no creature wants to be hungry or cold. Mm -hmm. and no creature wants to be eaten. So they're also designed to avoid pain. Mm -hmm. And then finally, they're also designed to conserve energy. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough just to pursue pleasure and avoid pain. You're also designed to take every shortcut you possibly can to get there. Uh, because if you don't, <clears throat> and so yeah. that's why the pleasure seeking, pain avoidance, and energy conservation are are the, the what I call the motivational triad, the three the three major components of motivation. Mm -hmm. And the modern food supply plays right into it. Exactly. Yeah. It, it it's a, it is why it is it has dominated the earth now in terms of uh, food consumption. Is that quite frankly? I was just eating an apple, mm -hmm. uh, came on, and it's a little sticky, and I got a little sticky on my hand. It's a little mm -hmm. hassle. Mm -hmm. Got a little in the back of my teeth. It's like, you know, a lot easier to drink apple juice. Mm -hmm. 
uh, than, to, than to eat an apple. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes when you chomp it into an apple, the skin gets between your teeth and cuts <laughs> a little bit. I mean, it's a remarkable hassle. Yeah. And um, actually, I, I talk about this in that if someone will ever core an apple for me, if anybody ever comes up and the apple's all cored and it's all easy to get, I don't have to work too hard to wiggle the thing off the off the core. Mm -hmm. It's all it's like, oh well, I'll eat a lot of little slices of apple because it's not going to cut my mouth and it's not going to make it's my easier. Hands stick. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's literally down at that level. Uh, the impulses uh, are are guiding our decision making. Uh, in this area and that makes like that i think is the missing piece for so many people because if you think about our food system i mean fast food that's you think about the you know avoidance of pain okay you think about the um the pleasure wanting pleasure and fast and you know artificial food is full of of chemicals that's going to make our dopamine surge in our brain we're going to feel really good and it's fast and it's easy it doesn't get any easier so that plays into all three of those motivational triads just like beautifully i mean in, okay. in such a destructive terrible way but it's no wonder now we are in this this state this this country and and so many well-developed nations are in yes. this this problem just knowing that little piece and so i think that for a lot of people once they know just that it, yeah. It's going to make so much more sense, and it's not just willpower. <laughs> right. I had a woman uh, came to the McDougal program a number of years ago, and I remember her well because she she was raising seven sons. Wow. If you can do that. No. And so, can't. <laughs> and so basically, her life was all about food production. She was basically mm -hmm. a one person restaurant, mm -hmm. and she said uh, when she got home. She she put grapes in a you know like a spaghetti colander mm -hmm. and washed them and put it in the refrigerator. Nobody ate them. And she had thought about this issue of energy conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, my attention to the very fine details on this, and uh, she said, "I just wonder what's going to happen." So she actually took the time to pull them all off the stock <laughs> and put them back in a bowl. Mm -hmm. They were gone in no time. <laughs> Like literally the effort to, to tear a thing off and then pull those things off the stock is enough to dissuade people from eating healthy food. Wow. Yeah. So that's this, incredible. Yeah. This is why, for example, um, uh, this is why the world, uh, modern world eats hamburgers. Mm -hmm. uh, they eat hamburgers because hamburgers, rather than what would be far more efficient from the standpoint of production, would be steak burgers, just slices of steak. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that if you uh, if you have a steak, you have to chew it, and mm -hmm. um, chewing the steak uh, requires an additional twelve percent of energy and digestion than if you have ground it up in a hamburger. Huh. So it turns out that hamburger is, even though it's the same material, it's effectively twelve percent more calorie dense. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Mind instantly recognizes this, mm -hmm. in which your instincts can instantly tell that this is a better deal. Mm -hmm. That's what people do. That's why we eat hamburger. That's right. And the the calorie density of things. This is really interesting. Well, let's let's first go back. I want to go to talk about the moods of happiness because mm -hmm. that was something that really really intrigued me, and I think is is just as important as the motivational triad itself because. You're right. I mean, you go in your book, you, you say, you know, there's more to life than just seeking pleasure, avoiding pain and conserving energy. Like there has right. to be more to that. And, and that's where these moods of happiness comes in. And I love this. Um, and so, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, the moods of happiness were, you know, of course, for 6,000 years of recorded history, people have speculated about happiness. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of very interesting philosophy and scripture been a lot of advice and a lot of it very good uh, very insightful about human nature but not until very recently we did we actually understand the purpose of happiness mm -hmm. we didn't have any idea and uh, so now we know so uh, modern essentially biology mm -hmm. has figured out that all feelings are signals mm -hmm. devices to tell organisms what to do mm -hmm. and that includes happiness so happiness is a device it's a mechanism that sits inside your brain as a potential. It's neural circuits inside your mind. Mm -hmm. And when, under certain conditions, those neural circuits will be activated. And certain conditions, they will not be activated. 
and unhappiness circuits will be activated. Mm -hmm. And so I'll step you through this so that you can see how this thing works. Okay. If you're a very simple organism, like you're an alligator lizard, mm -hmm. uh, all you have is basically pain and pleasure. You don't have mood states because you're a very simple creature. You either mm -hmm. eat the fly or you don't eat the fly. You either get the mate or you don't get the mate. There's no, there's no long-term planning and complex chains of action associated with your success or failure. Mm -hmm. It's immediate. Okay. okay. So, but if you have a creature that is much more sophisticated mm -hmm. and it actually has to plot uh, in advance how, what, how it's going to do things, mm -hmm. you need a guidance system other than the pleasure and the pain to tell it what to do. So, uh, for example, if um, if you are, let's suppose you're some young uh some young man that's in a history class at the, at the college, at the university there. Mm -hmm. He's, he sees a young lady that he finds attractive. So he goes up to her and he asks her out, and she says yes. So that creates a mood of happiness. Mm -hmm. now, I think we can all see that the purpose of his life is not the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. That's not what the pursuit, that is not the goal here. The goal is not happiness. Happiness is a signaling device. Mm -hmm signaling device that tells him he just got closer to the pleasure. Mm -hmm. so the pleasure is where the real action, pleasure or pain, is where the real action hits the road in terms of survival and reproductive success. Mm -hmm. So if he takes her out on a date and he's saying some funny things and she's laughing, when she's happy, he's happy. Mm -hmm. It creates happiness because it tells him he's getting closer to his goal. Mm -hmm. okay? Now if he tells an off-color joke and she frowns, then he's unhappy. Mm -hmm. The anxiety and unhappy so his mood will shift instantly mm -hmm. like uh oh it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Why? That's a device to tell him that he just got further from his goal. Mm -hmm. So we see that in fact his moods are shifting very quickly mm -hmm. to tell him either keep going on that strategy because it's working, mm -hmm. i.e. that's what happiness is, mm -hmm. or shift strategy because something just went wrong. So you just watch this on a sports team or a sports fan watching their team. Mm -hmm. Things are going well, they're happy. Things go poorly, they're unhappy. Mm -hmm. Back, forth, back, forth. They're just constantly shifting. Mm -hmm. This is this is the nature of life. Mm -hmm. So for, for creatures that have complicated goals like making a touchdown or, you know, initiating a relationship um, or getting a promotion, mm -hmm. what you do is you're looking for cues that you are making progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, in other words, but well before we get to any final final action, mm -hmm. you are seeing that there's evidence of progress, and your mood states, if you're a sophisticated creature, they're reading that and they're saying, "That's right, we're on the right track. Keep doing what we're doing because we're it looks like it's working. Mm -hmm. That's what happiness is. Mm -hmm. So happiness and unhappiness are actually integrated with pain and pleasure." as methods to help you get to have uh, to get to pleasure and to avoid pain mm -hmm. so very sophisticated they, they fit together like a glove perfect for a hand mm -hmm. and so that's that's literally what happiness is is a secondary guidance system for sophisticated creatures like ourselves okay so when somebody is stuck in that pleasure trap and they're yes. um you know eating that fast food and those processed foods and they're just stuck in that stuck in that it, those moods of happiness, then they kind of disappear because they don't have to work for that, that those triads, right? Because it's just right there. So you don't go through that process of find, you know, reaching that goal. Is that true? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. The, um, let's just talk a little bit about what's happening. The, yeah, in other words, you're designed by nature to, to take every shortcut you can to get to the pleasure. Mm-hmm. So if, if the young man had an incredible joke that would somehow get her into bed in the next five minutes, uh -huh. you would tell it. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay? So that's, uh, but, but we're designed in such a way that usually the problems of life are sufficiently competitive. Uh -huh. We have to, have to go through a series of steps to get there. Right. You don't get to be an English professor, you don't get to be a school teacher, and you don't get to be a world champion boxer just because you wanted it and you tried really hard for a little while. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, hold on one second. Your, your, your audio is going in and out. Try again. Your, um, 
the moods of the moods of happiness are are a device to to give us intermittent guidance. Right. Is what they are. The um, if we can anything that we can do to short circuit our way to the pleasure, we will do it. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is what makes the pleasure trap a problem. Right. So people are designed to be getting pleasure from their food, um, and they're designed to get essentially a certain amount of it. Mm -hmm. And they have to go through a certain amount of chewing, for example, to get there. Mm -hmm. And and they're supposed to be getting modest amounts of pleasure as they go through that process. Right. If they can get more pleasure for less work, they will do so. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's why it is that they do what they do. Mm -hmm. So the, um, what you're you're referring to something interesting, though, is I, I believe you're you're alluding to this, and that is that that if we have super normal stimuli like the modern food supply or drugs, mm -hmm. so we have something that's not natural that hits the pleasure centers very hard. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen is the person is not likely to do the the intermediate level steps uh, in any process that exactly. will actually result in the moods of happiness being generated. Mm -hmm. So can imagine, for example, the, uh, for example, endorphins will be re released uh, with respect to relief. Mm -hmm. So for people or physical relief from pain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so for example, you work really hard and make sure that your kid is safe, and um, and so you you feel you feel relief uh, mm -hmm. because the kid got through. Well, let's suppose it was uh, his graduation ceremony from the from the sixth grade, and he had to give a little speech, and so you're really stressed because he's really stressed, mm -hmm. and he loses a bunch of status. And that status would indicate, incidentally, that if he lost status in the village, that it might reduce his mating cachet. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be remembered for years that he made a fool out of himself at the sixth grade graduation. Mm -hmm. And so, result, however, he could gain cachet from doing a good job. Mm -hmm. and so, so, he is very worried about this. And so, he is very stressed about this because he's naturally concerned about his, his cachet because it's it's going to follow him around for a while, and it could be in a Stone Age village, there aren't any new people. Mm -hmm. So this is the same 80 people that you're going to be getting your mates and friends from. Mm -hmm. So if you've got some big moment uh, when you're 12 years old, it's a big moment, and it's going to be remembered, and it could influence your your success in that village, mm -hmm. uh, potentially substantially. So your kid is stressed, and you are stressed. So you're, you're having the same feelings over the same stakes, even though, even though you should know better, but your instincts aren't really telling you this. Mm -hmm. Your instincts are caught back in the Stone Age, and you're feeling like this is very serious. Mm -hmm. so he practices, he practices, and he's stressed. And then he does a good job, and you feel relieved. Mm -hmm. So you have this endorphin high that comes out of this thing mm -hmm. that lingers on for a few hours, mm -hmm. and it. Very nice, and it comes comes to you in little waves during the next few days. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, you did a good job. What a relief! It could have been a disaster. Mm -hmm. so that's a very pleasant feeling. But you earned that feeling, and he earned that feeling by all the hard work that he did diligently up to it. And then he takes a big chance, he succeeds, and there's a relief that he didn't fail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can get that same endorphin rush. In fact, you can get it times ten. If you shoot heroin, mm -hmm. okay, so you can get that feeling of accomplishment and relief that you have actually taken a big stress off of your life, mm -hmm. and that are much better and much safer. All you have to do is poke an opiate in your arm. Mm -hmm. See how you see how seductive this could be. Mm -hmm. So this is effectively the short circuiting of happiness. Mm -hmm. The person who uses the heroin goes through no diligent process. Mm -hmm. It goes through no victorious process yeah. of achievement, okay? And no complicated mood states about, wow, that was really good, I did a good job, I get to look back on it. None of these reverberating processes. Mm -hmm. All we are after is the enormous physical feeling of relief that comes with the release of that neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. That's how you wind up with an addict, mm -hmm. okay? This is uh, the same process is happening with food on a much lower level, mm -hmm. but it's the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we're designed by nature to have the feeling of achievement 
be accentuated with my pleasure. Yeah. And if we cannot achieve anything but keep getting these accentuations, then we can get caught in a trap where effectively we're giving up both our health and our happiness. Yeah. Uh, we're giving up our competitive advantage with respect to our shape and our self-esteem. Mm-hmm. And our, our, our romantic uh, attractiveness cachet, mm-hmm. all that get, gets into trouble while we keep hitting the little accentuated button. Mm-hmm. And there's some kind of a compensation. Uh, and it's really not enough. It's a bad trade, but it's a tricky one. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so complicated. And there's, with our food system the way that it is today, there's just, I think you said it in the book, that it makes the door wide open for... Yes to get stuck, to get stuck in this trap. And I think it's really interesting because you see, you know, a lot of people who are addicted to these really terrible foods, even though they do create that, that dopamine rush. And yes, eating a a Snickers bar and a package of Cheetos is initially going to make you kind of high and eating some kale and quinoa isn't going to provide that same, same rush. But yet the people, right. the, the people eating the Snickers bar and the Cheetos are, you know, they're they're much less happy overall than the people eating the kale and the quinoa. It's that you don't have those those huge, um, I guess, dips. It's more like yes. even. Yes, um, you, there there's the, the there's nothing in principle wrong with the Cheetos and donuts, but the problem is is that because they're artificial and they're pinging the daylights out of the system, they, you are therefore drawn by your instincts to consume them. You will overconsume mm-hmm. because they're super rich foods that the system wasn't designed for. Mm-hmm. People will become overweight. The average American woman gains 40 pounds between her 16th birthday and her 36th birthday. Mm-hmm. Gains two pounds a year, nibbling away at this rich food. Mm-hmm. And then essentially her attractiveness and her self-esteem are in the trash can. Mm-hmm. So the, the price to this is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. The, the psychological and physical prices are enormous. Uh, the, the seductive nature of it is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It's so insidious. It's very difficult for people to get out of it, even if they know it's there. Mm-hmm. So that's why, uh, Molly, this, this type of educational forum, uh, to get people alerted and yeah. to, to get them to realizing, wait a minute, this is, it's not so simple, apparently. Mm-hmm. No wonder I'm having trouble. And it turns out, yes, if you're having trouble, you're not the only one. Yeah, yeah. A lot of highly intelligent, highly conscientious, highly motivated company. Mm-hmm. And, um, so this is, the story of the pleasure trap is the story of how we are essentially underestimating what I call the hidden force mm-hmm. that undermines health and happiness. It's hidden because you don't, you don't really appreciate it. Mm. It, it's kind of like the really smart, quiet girl in the back of the room that nobody really knows is there, and it turns out she's three steps ahead of everybody. Mm. It's like it's the pleasure trap. Mm. The pleasure trap is like three steps ahead of you, mm-hmm. and it, it it takes some real doing to you, you never completely get get ahead of this thing perfectly, mm-hmm. but you can, you can master it to the point where it's not mastering you. Mm-hmm. And that's that's about as much as we can hope for. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that then, that, that then, um, getting out of this pleasure trap. So if somebody is currently in it, um, what, what's the, well, what's the most successful way of getting out? There's, there's several things that the the most successful way. So if, if there's somebody out there that is incredibly frustrated, very motivated and just banging their head against the wall and they've tried everything. The most dramatic thing that you can possibly do is a water fast. Mm-hmm. So that's what we do at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa. Is yeah. that uh, obviously this isn't something for everybody, and it's not practical for everybody. Mm-hmm. But uh, a water fast is actually the most extraordinary tool that exists for resensitizing the palate. Yeah. Because if you it puts the entire uh, olfactory and, and gustatory system under sensory deprivation. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just like shutting all the lights off in your house and darkening the windows. Mm. Uh, if we tap with a candle after 10 minutes, that candle seems bright. Right. So the, mm, um, so we shut down all food and we don't eat anything for a week. Mm-hmm. It's out that a week later, healthy food that normally tastes kind of bland and modest tastes 
way better. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's the way you were designed to be tasting food. Yep. So remember, all animals actually vigorously love their natural food. Mm -hmm. okay? they, they have to be designed that way. Yeah. So the fact that human beings currently do not love their natural food tells you that something is very much amiss. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, and that, what's amiss is is that the, the taste systems are ha, have been uh, educated in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. and so they are they're simply not sensitive. Mm -hmm. We're like a golfer who you, he, he can't feel his fingers because he's got so many calluses all over him because he doesn't wear blood. Mm -hmm. He just can't feel them all. And so the, the solution to that is to not golf for a while. And then what will happen is the calluses will go away. Uh -huh. And if, if you don't eat for a while, the, the taste sensitivity immediately returns in a matter of a few days. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's number one. The second way to do it is uh, little miniature versions of that. Mm -hmm. So a miniature version is to go 24 hours and don't eat. So go from Friday night, have dinner, don't eat till Saturday night. Even skipping a couple of meals will help. Mm -hmm. That that will help taste sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, probably maybe two or three days or a couple, you know, a day or two, just on a juice, like carrot and apple juice or something mm -hmm. like that. If you do that, what will happen is is that um, you take all the fat and all the salt out of the diet, mm -hmm. and so the taste buds become more sensitive to fat and salt over a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. And uh, finally, the, a good thing to do is just realize that you got to be diligent. And uh, as Alan says, you got to choke it down for a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, and literally at the end of four or five days, your taste buds start a significant process of becoming resensitized, mm -hmm. continue on that path for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. So continue to get more and more sensitive, but they will do most of their work in terms of reclaiming sensitivity uh -huh. within, within, say, 21 days. Uh -huh. So three you're, weeks, you're yeah. about three weeks from being mostly out of this thing. And, and that's, uh, that's like what's so frustrating though about it because you see all these people and it's like you're only three weeks away <laughs> you know everybody yeah. is only three weeks away from getting out of this trap um it's it's mind-boggling and people are so i mean people die from it you know yes. when it's like it's so attainable it's so there you just have to do it um but they have yes. to know what's happening and you know and that's why what you know the work that you do and put out in your this this book has been so important for so many people because there's a lot of people who just don't know yes yeah i have i had this feeling once i uh, was moving a refrigerator and it was on a like a slick concrete floor mm -hmm. and we were sliding it because the floor was slick and it was on these little it might have been even on rollers uh -huh. uh, it was and so we were rolling it and we hit the threshold of another room, mm -hmm. and there was a tiny little raise, and it was about maybe a sixteenth of an inch, just the tiniest little room. And the refrigerator was extremely heavy, and we were like in trouble. It basically stopped. Mm -hmm. Wow, a sixteenth of an inch. <laughs> the world stopped. And this is very much what this is like. Like, mm. it's not going to take you very long. It's not, you know, it's not that big of a problem, mm -hmm. but it's just big enough to stop you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is the problem. Obviously, we had to wrestle that thing and then get the little wheels or whatever. We had to really rock it to get the wheels up over that tiny little threshold. Yeah. And that reminds me of the three weeks. Yeah. It's like you got to like really rock that refrigerator and get it up over that threshold so you can start sliding again. That's right. It's just like. Yeah, you're yeah. very you're you're excellent with analogies. I love that because they're very easy to you you get it. You know, it's not yeah. some big grand thing that you can't understand. You really have a way of honing it in that's really relatable. Um, and you're right, that is a great that's a great way to think about it. <clears throat> and I have I run a I, every year I run a live um, five week plant based reset to help people kind of reset their their taste buds and their whole life really. And so yeah. part of what I have them do is a is a fast for a few days. And it's amazing, you know, after the second day, they're like, I just want broccoli. Like, I just want a yeah. big bowl of broccoli, or I just want carrots, or I just want a strawberry. 
and the food that they crave is the food that they should be eating again and and I even have them do like in the very beginning I have them eat like something that's that's really um, highly stimulating so like have yeah. a little bite of ice cream have a little bit of Snickers bar write that down you know and then yes. have a carrot and write that down and then at the end of the fast I have them eat those same two things again and then write it down and it's completely opposite and people can't even you know they'll spit out that highly um stimulating food and they're like i can't yes. even believe that it doesn't taste how i thought it tasted you know it's amazing to watch this um transformation of the taste buds and the and the signals that, that they're the food send in the brain so it's quite um intriguing so yes. yeah fantastic yeah that's yeah. great Molly. so let's see i had another let me just see i, I had a couple more questions and and this is kind of a, a personal um, question, but I just, if you, do you have a couple more minutes, then we can wrap up? Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so is there um, a line where, it, that's blurred between kind of the pleasure trap or being stuck in the pleasure trap and being, let's say, a binge eater or an alcoholic or like an addict? Does, it, does mm -hmm. that make sense? Because I, I know that um, I've had, I abused alcohol for many years and I quit drinking. It's been two years since I haven't had a drink. Um, it'll be two years next week. And there's a lot of people who, it's not necessarily food related, but because what I do is, is food, um, there's a lot of people who can relate to what I went through with my struggle with alcohol, but it's just instead of alcohol, it's food. And so where yes. does that line kind of cross or blur between, you know, just being in the pleasure trap or, and then, actually being like ha being in genetically predisposed to addiction does that make sense right. yeah you're essentially the the right way to look at any kind of any kind of drug addiction mm -hmm. is on a continuum mm -hmm. uh not either yes or no and so the i worked with a lot of people over the years it's very convenient for, for science and practitioners to draw the line and say, oh, well, if you have 16 drinks away, you're an alcoholic. So right, so right here, she. Uh, but that, that's in science, that's what we call a cutting score. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a certain score that over a certain level, we're going to give you a label. Mm -hmm. And under that, we're going to give you a different label. Because then we're going to run scientific analyses on these people versus these people. Mm -hmm. So we got to make a decision somewhere. But the truth of the matter is, it's a continuum. Hmm. That's actually the correct way to view what you're observing, mm -hmm. is that it's on a continuum. So you have people, for example, with respect to alcohol, that, that uh, it's not that they've never had it, but if they did have it, for example, there's people that would have a very mild response to it, maybe even a little bit negative. Mm -hmm. and they're just kind of like, no, I have no interest in that at all. Hmm. Even though it is stoking the dopamine and endorphin pathways, it's having other effects besides that that are can, can be uh, interpreted or felt as unpleasant to an individual. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Okay, someone else who's configured a little bit differently, just slightly differently uh, by their genes, mm -hmm. having an extremely positive response uh, to this, and so that that person is a loaded gun for alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's everybody in between. So if you lined up 100 people with one one degree of individual difference between them, between one and 100, mm -hmm. you know, a, a person that's at 100 is exceedingly likely to become an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And person at one is there's no chance. Mm -hmm. And so the um, so this is kind of how to look at this problem. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true with food. So you will see people. I have met a few of these people, not many, but I have over the years, that read the Starch Solution or they read the China study. Mm -hmm. And that's it. They they then they uh, started doing what it says in the book, the recipes in yep. the back, and uh, that's it. They never looked back. Yep. And so, uh, most people, I would say the common response is, well, I read it, I was really motivated, I was really interested, I started to do it. And I tried to do it for a little while, then I got off track. And so that was about three or four years ago. And then last year, you know, my mom died. Of a mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And then I got nervous about it. I started doing it again. Now I'm really struggling. 
and you know I lost 20 pounds, then I gained 10 back. Like that yep. is yep. absolutely typical. Yep. That's like right down the middle of the bell curve. Yep. So the then we have people that are at the 99 or 100 level, where they're they're a live wire, and and the food is super potent for them, and yeah. it's exceedingly difficult for them to stay out of it, and um, they will. Uh, and a lot of times we'll have, we'll have binge eaters that that are so reactive to the processed foods mm -hmm. that they will, they will essentially you and I would call it going crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, they they might eat ten thousand calories at the sitting. I mean, yeah. It's so overwhelming that they could that they can. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I would say that it's rare, but it, it can happen that I can wind up with a binge eater who's binging on whole natural foods. Uh huh. It's not typical. Though. Uh huh. And uh, that, that is a that's a, a strange neurochemical individuality that's that's very rare. Uh -huh. the, uh, those people exist, and there's some tricks that I use to try to help those individuals. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't even bother talking about those tricks to the general public because then they'll think that means everything. Right. Binge people with a binge eating problem are binge eating because. They are, they're at the 90 level mm -hmm. on our website, mm -hmm. and as such, they're a real live wire. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we get them around around processed foods, yep. very rich foods, they go crazy. Mm -hmm. And that, the, usually the key to binge eating is, is the discipline to get out of the pleasure trap, except it's harder. Yeah, because... Yeah, and you know the, the the well, it all sucks. But one of the hardest things about that is that unlike drinking, because I haven't had a drink for two years, and that's fantastic. I don't have to drink. I can yeah. avoid it completely. But with people who, you know, have the same kind of struggles, but with food, it's like they have to eat. <laughs> they can't just avoid it completely. So that presents um, a, a unique challenge that is different from the alcohol or drug scenarios. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. I, I've never heard it um, explained that way, so I really appreciate you you talking about it. It, it makes a lot of sense. So yeah. thank you for that. So one, okay, I just thought of one other thing. I could probably talk well, to you all day, but I'm not going to. I promise. I, I, I'm respecting your time, and I'm going to wrap this up soon. But I have, well, I want to talk about the cal um, cal uh, caloric density for a minute of different yes. foods because I found that really interesting, and it explains why you know somebody who is just getting off from the standard American diet. If they're handed a plate of beautiful, you know, a baked sweet potato and maybe some steamed broccoli and, uh, you know, a green salad, they're going to eat that and it's going to taste pretty nasty to them. Um, yeah. But then the more they eat that, the more they eat that, it's going to actually taste better to them over time. But can you talk about like the role that um, caloric density plays in that and people's perception of how satisfying something is? Yes. Um Calorie density is really the story of how much energy is in the food, mm -hmm. how much energy is available to, to the animal. And so uh, survival instinct number one is eat the richest food in the environment. There is four per chew. Uh, the animal is essentially designed by nature to try to get as much energy per chew as it can get. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so the, the highest density food possible is, is oil. Or pure fat mm -hmm. at 4,000 calories a pound. Uh, the lowest density food possible is raw salad greens. Those are 100 calories a pound. Yeah. So you can you can imagine what would be more popular in the world, whether it's raw salad greens or oil and fat. Mm -hmm. So uh, and because oil and fat are literally 40 times as efficient at getting you energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we move down the scale from oil. The next place we're going to stop is something a concoction like chocolate. Mm -hmm. so chocolate's um, very high oil and then the sugar. So chocolate's about 3,000 calories a pound. Mm -hmm. uh, go up from salad greens on the other side. The next place we hit are vegetables that we really cook. So a cooked vegetable, carrots, um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower. Those are about 200 calories a pound. Mm -hmm. So uh, cooked vegetables are therefore about one fifteenth as efficient as chocolate. Mm -hmm. You can see chocolate should be massively more sought after, which is why you're going to see it in every vending machine. Mm -hmm. Because fortunes have been made 
and making chocolate available uh, because it, it feels like an unbelievable steal of the century. Mm -hmm. a creature that was designed to just carve out a living looking for the richest food into the environment. And there wasn't anything like chocolate in the environment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Close to chocolate would have been nuts and seeds. Uh -huh. uh, 2,500 calories a pound. Mm -hmm. the nuts and seeds are pretty heavily protected. Those are extremely rich energy storage devices designed to produce a new plant. Mm -hmm. So the plants defend those with shells and they also defend them. Um, uh, hmm, interesting. With, with okay. Difficult yeah. to chew. Uh -huh. uh, and so as a result, our ancestors would have eaten some of them, but not, but not a lot, a lot. of them. Yeah. It has to be gathered. Hmm. So in the modern environment, we, we shell them, and not only we shell them, we cook them. Mm -hmm. And not only do we shell them and we cook them, we also grind them up into paste. Mm -hmm. So we make them exceedingly easy to eat mm -hmm. and salt them up. Mm -hmm. So we've essentially taken a 2,500 calorie pound, a very rich resource, and we've turned it into an extremely easy resource for people to eat. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the richest food really in nature that you would ever chomp your teeth into of any significance mm -hmm. uh, would have been animal food mm -hmm. uh, our ancestors ate some of and when they did animal food would have been about um, somewhere between 800 and a thousand calories a pound mm -hmm. so nut butter is two and a half times the caloric density of the animal food mm -hmm. so you see where the appeal is mm -hmm. uh, same thing is too true of a potato chip so chips for example these things are about 2500 calories a pound um, that's because they're essentially a vector for oil. Mm -hmm. uh, they just slice a potato and they dip it in oil. It's basically like a little sponge. Mm -hmm. And uh, this becomes a mechanism for human beings to get that 4,000 calorie pound of oil. Mm -hmm. so start to look at what people eat. They're eating very rich diets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the next thing down on the scale, or the next thing up on the scale from 200 calories a pound vegetables would be free. Uh, at 300 calories a pound. Mm -hmm. Very clearly see that fruit and chocolate are essentially trying to piggyback on the same mechanisms. So it's the sweetness and the calorie density that we love in fruit. Mm -hmm. Literally one tenth as dense calorically as the chocolate. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like to point out to people that in an apple, an average apple is about half a pound. And it takes about 15 bites to eat it. So it's got about 150 calories. And so it's a, they're in your mouth when you have a, a reasonable amount of apple in your mouth, you've got about 10 calories. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the apple is sour, it's likely to have 10% less calories in it. So it's probably got nine calories. Mm -hmm. So literally at 10 calories in your mouth, you're pretty good. And at nine calories in your mouth, you're all upset about it. You're not gonna <laughs> eat. So you're literally over one calorie Check the difference. Wow. Now, I find out that when huh. you put a chunk of apple uh, or chocolate in your mouth, it's 10 times the calorie density of the apple. Hmm. So there's 100 calories in your mouth. Hmm. So I want you to think of this. Nine calories is awful. You're not going to eat it. 10 calories is good and you're going to eat it. What do you think the system is doing when we go out to 100? It's getting uh, jacked up. <laughs> getting, it's a firework show. Yeah. So it's a, uh, so this, this tells you that the creature basically says, oh my God, this is, the, this is an incredible deal. Best thing ever, oh, yeah. And this is, this is what happens. And so this is, you know, cheese is 1,700 calories a pound, super rich, richer than anything you're going to eat in nature. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, people are going to put cheese sauce and butter sauce at 4,000 calories a pound all over their stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I've been in restaurants where I ordered the vegetable thing. And, you know, and then it came out with a bunch of cheese all over it. I'm like, I forgot. And well, it's not in the menu. Or I didn't look closely enough. It was the vegetable delight. And mm -hmm. there it is. It's like they can't imagine that somebody would not want a bunch of 1,700 calorie pound juice squirted all over their vegetables. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is this is what we face. Yeah. Uh, we It's a constant vigilance against not only not only ourselves trying to seek these things out, but also the environment is trying to offer it to us at every turn mm -hmm. because um, it's the most successful way to behave commercially. Mm -hmm. You don't behave that way, you're going to be outcompeted by someone who does. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, calorie density is, is really the, important. 
actually, if you look at it this way, Molly, really calorie density is a is a signaling uh, the, the pleasure mechanism mm -hmm. is actually signaling energy conservation. Mm -hmm. That's what it's doing. When mm -hmm. you really taste preferences, you find all three components of the motivational triad. You want to eat to avoid the pain of starvation. Check. You're designed yep. by nature to seek pleasure in order to get rid of that pain. Mm -hmm. And the pleasure is more enhanced the more calories per bite in the food. Mm -hmm. So you're driven to eliminate pain by a pleasure-seeking mechanism that is designed by nature around the principle of energy conservation. Mm -hmm. Put that organism, any doesn't matter whether we're talking about a mouse or a human, when you put them in, in an environment where there's a lot of these rich foods, mm -hmm. they very, very quickly and vigorously, and it's hard to talk them out of it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so that's, that is what I'm trying to share with your listeners, yeah. that if you have struggled, this is no weakness of your own. Mm. This is weakness of the species. Yeah. And it's a, it's a trap that we have set for ourselves, and only, only a few really motivated people that are in the know and really determined uh, can carve their way out, and you can. Yeah. And probably carve your way out six times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a lot of people so, do <laughs> over okay. and over again. And sometimes that's that's exactly what it takes. Now, just one quick follow up question with the um, nut butters. So yes. if somebody is wanting to get out of the pleasure trap in there, even if they're eating, you know, a pretty healthy whole food plant based diet, can you successfully kind of get out of this trap while still eating a small amount of, let's say, you know, unsweetened and unsalted uh, almond butter? Or sunflower seed butter, some you know stuff like that. Yeah, it's, uh, particularly if it's unsalted, mm -hmm. uh, that makes a big difference. Uh, the I, I would say that once again we're back on that continuum of one to a hundred. Mm -hmm. I would say a, a lot of people, if they use a little bit of this rich food, they can do really well. Okay, uh, they, they can. A lot of people can do well. However, you have to be careful. Yeah. Um, People need to know, particularly with respect to weight loss, yeah. uh, one of the big problems in weight loss is bread products. Mm -hmm. uh, so bread products, you know, the, the conventional world blames carbs, which is insane. Yes. But the truth is... is High that five to that. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, they're one third right. And that is that a huge amount of the carbs that are eaten, people are eating almost no baked potatoes or baked yams or rice or beans or corn or... Mm -hmm. Oats. They're not eating any of that, but what they're eating is a lot of bread products. Mm -hmm. uh, they're eating muffins, and they're eating Cinnabon, and they're eating sandwiches, etc. And even if you're talking about whole wheat bread, whole grain bread that's pretty healthy, mm -hmm. it's still very rich. Mm -hmm. And so it's still 1,700 calories a pound, which is very rich food for a human. Mm -hmm. So if you have people, and I have a lot of them, who will... Um, call me up for consultations and they are struggling and they're frustrated because they're still 20 or 30 pounds overweight and they think they're doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And doing things really intelligently from the standpoint of biochemistry. In other words, they're not eating anything that is harmful. The problem is, is that they're eating quite a bit of, uh, of these processed cereal grains in, in the form of bread and crackers and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's, that's why I have a I never go up around nut butter because you're not eating it with a spoon. You're spreading it on something. Mm -hmm. So now we we don't. It's not that we have a little bit of of uh, a little bit of raw or fresh almond butter in our salad. No, that isn't what's happening. We're spreading a bunch of it on top of bread, mm -hmm. and we are believing it's healthy, which biochemically it's quite healthy, but it's also far richer mm. than that of our natural history and. While your young 12-year-old son or daughter can do this, um, and you might have been able to do it at 19, if you're 39 and you're 30 pounds overweight, it's probably too rich for you. Mm -hmm. And that you, you have to move the line over on that dimension if you're going to be more successful. Mm -hmm. And does that include um, sprouted bread as well? Yeah, sprouted bread is, great, is a great product, mm -hmm. and so that's what I eat. Mm -hmm. That's what I bought for my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I had somebody who was really fighting their weight and they were doing everything else right, yep. that, uh, what I say about things like that is I say they're innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> you know, if you've actually done everything else right and you're still struggling, 
then we then we put that one under the magnifying glass yeah. as as the as the last wall that needs to fall. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Good. Good. Oh, this has been so fantastic. I've just loved talking with you. I've learned a lot, and I know that uh, my readers are just gonna just gobble this up. And again, get this book, everybody: The Pleasure Trap um, by Doug Lyle. It is an amazing read, and you can't you you can't. It's like Pandora's box. Once you read this, you can't go back. I mean, everything, this is a game changer, you know? Um, and so thank you for writing it. And thank you for the work that you do in the world. And thank you for sitting down with me and being so generous with your time and sharing with me your knowledge. So I really, really appreciate that. Pleasure. Thank you. And say hi anytime. It's fine, Molly. Okay. Thanks so much. I'll talk soon. Bye. Bye.